Hi, uh, here we are for chapter five. Um, in this lecture, we're gonna be covering motor skills and sensory and perception development. So that's what I just said, right? So um, your motor skills are your ability to move, right? All your muscles, um, your coordination, um, certainly when you're a baby, learning how to crawl, walk, and move, and um, into adulthood. So we'll cover that. And then our sensory systems, right? You think about um, all of our different senses, uh, vision, hearing, taste, touch, smell. And then we also have balance and our kinesthetic sense or our sense of our body position in space. But really, we're just gonna focus mostly on vision and then a little bit with some of the other uh, first four that I mentioned. Um, and just to kind of keep in mind throughout this lecture, um, a kind of guiding um, principle, not really principle, but in my mind is this dynamic systems theory. It's the idea that all of these things are working together, right? We are, as humans, as living creatures, uh, we're motivated to develop our motor skills uh, because of what we're perceiving in the environment around us and then wanting to engage, right, and take action. So repeating those motor movements to try um, to improve our ability to interact with the environment. So that those things work together. And this is something we'll talk about a lot um, in our next section of the course when we talk about Piaget's theory of cognitive development. Okay. So we'll come back to that. It'll just be called Piaget, sensory motor stage. We're here, um, we're thinking of it as the dynamic systems theory. Okay, so motor skills. Um, when you're born, you don't really have a lot of motor skills. Um, you do have uh, reflexes though. So reflexes are automatic. Let me get this out of the way here. They're automatic. They don't really require any thought at all, right? Your body just does them. Uh, and here are four common reflexes that are found in infancy. Uh, you can try these out, or maybe you've experienced this yourself if you've spent any time with, with an infant. The rooting reflex is the fact that if you touch the baby's cheek, they're gonna turn to try to put whatever that is in their mouth, right? So this is a reflex, and it's to promote feeding. The grasping reflex, Right? You can see that if you put your finger in a baby's palm, they're going to automatically close their hand around it. That's the grasping reflex. The sucking reflex, right? whatever you put in their mouth, your finger, a nipple, they're going to start sucking automatically. This requires, again, no thought. And then the moral reflex or startle reflex. Um, this is the fact that if um, you lay the baby down like this or they feel like they're going to fall, they'll throw their arms out and arch their back. Okay, there are some other reflexes, but these are kind of some main ones to give you an idea. And this is what babies are born with. And through these reflex responses, they're gonna start um, voluntarily doing some of these motor movements to try to explore their environment. As we move um, uh, into several weeks and months of life, we can start to see gross motor skill development. So gross motor skills are movements of large muscle groups. So moving your arms, doing um, jumping, um, even a cartwheel, that's gross motor movement. Uh, and we can just have a general timeline. This um, chart is from your book, so you can take a look at that. But essentially, um, you can see kind of the, the pattern of the gross motor movement development from learning to lift their head, right, which is really fun to watch, right? <laughs> Kids, their head looks so heavy, you put them on their tummy, they're just, oh, it's exhausting trying to lift that head, right? You got to build up those muscles. Um, that's a gross motor movement, right? So they're learning how to do that. As the months go by, they can start to um, use their arms for supporting their upper body, learning to roll over. That's always fun. Um, sitting without support, right? Here's a cute baby sitting up. Um, pulling themselves up to stand. And really the main milestone we're looking at is right around age one is um, being able to walk, right? So on average, most uh, babies will take their first steps at age one. 
um, some earlier, some later, right? As you can see, there's wide variation in these. Okay, so that's our um, milestones for gross motor movement. We can also talk about fine motor skills. So if gross motor skills are using large muscle groups to move, fine motor skills are using very small muscle groups, like in your hands, right? That call, requires fine um, motor coordination, right? So does learning how to talk, right? Which if you, when we go to language later in the semester, um, you start with these large movements, ba ba ba, and then you have to really learn what I'm doing right now requires a lot of coordination. But anyway, let's talk about our hands. Um, we can see in babies, I already talked about that reflex, right? The grasping reflex. Well, here you can see that's called the palmer grasp, right? You put something in the baby's palm, they're going to grasp it. Um, and they can get really good at this, right? Babies are grabbing things, they're grabbing toys, they're grabbing your hair, if you've ever had that happen. It's really hard to get that <laughs> sticky hand out of your hair. And then um, they have uh, evolved to using the pincer grasp, right? Which is using your, your finger and thumb to pick things up. And in this picture, you can see this uh, child is trying to pick up a piece of food, right? So this requires a lot of practice. And this is a fine motor skill. As we move into childhood, right, um, age three, let's say, um, potty training is a huge skill, right? And it's not just a motor skill, right? It requires some cognitive um, development and emotional development and social relationships with the parent. Um, it is not an easy uh, task and that child has to be motivated. But it is a motor skill, right? Pulling up and down your pants, getting on the potty, um, all the things that go with it. Um, that is usually happening by um, three, three and a half is potty training. And then um, some just to note, some other gross motor skills that you'll see, age three, hopping, jumping, running, and age four, climbing, right? Going up and down the stairs. Um, going up is pretty easy, going down a little bit harder. Um, about 90% of kids at this age are going to, it's going to be determined that they're right-handed, about 10% left-handed. Thankfully, we live in an era where it's okay to be left-handed. This was not true um, 60 years ago, let's say, when they would force everyone to be a right-handed person in America. Uh, so this just comes about naturally, right, how you're using those hands. Um, but 90% uh, typically are right-handed. Also in childhood, right, age four, five, six, is where we start to see um, the entrance into organized sports. Uh, certainly, uh, there are lots of four-year-olds that are on soccer teams, right? It's pretty hilarious because, I mean, they're four, right? So it's just kind of a blob of kids chasing a soccer ball around. Uh, but this um, can be a great opportunity for these kids to develop their motor skills, right? We see, um, Usually, at least in my community, age five, kindergarten is t-ball for baseball. Um, so you're working on that um, coordination, right, of being able to swing the bat, using your sensory system of vision, we'll get to that in a minute, right, that hand-eye coordination to try to hit the ball, the rules, running the bases, lots of social interactions. So there are tons of positives with doing organized sports. Um, in many areas outside of physical development even. Are there negatives to doing organized sports? I'm sure you could probably think of a few, right? I do think it's kind of nice early on in, you know, early childhood to be doing sports because um, I've found kids are not super competitive. They're still all trying to figure out the rules. So it's okay to have kids that really are not very good at sports participating. Um, as you get older, that can often change, right? Where you have maybe some negative experiences with peers. Um, my goodness, even parents can be um, unpleasant with organized sports. And then some sports, let's face it, they're just too expensive, right? They require um, investment in equipment, um, paying fees to play and, uh, that can be um, nearly impossible for some families. Um, my son right now, my younger son, is interested in golf. I think I mentioned that in one of the earlier videos. And, you know, thank goodness for the Blackwood Woods Metro Park golf course because it is 
free for Franklin County kids <laughs> or teenagers. Um, if I had to try to find some kind of golf course or country club, that it just wouldn't be happening, right? So looking for those opportunities can really help. Um, I'm sure you can think yourself of different positives and negatives um, that you've experienced yourself um, or, you know, just brainstorming, right? Okay. So moving into early adulthood, um, where many of you are right now, age 20 to 40, you are at your physical peak with your motor skills. How's it going? I, I hope it's going well. Um, enjoy it. Um, when we move past that, past age 40, into middle adulthood and then late adulthood, you're going to start to see declines. Now, of course, you can combat this with exercise, with engaging in sports and other motor activities. Um, but you will see, um, as you age, slower reaction times. So that's how fast can you respond to something. So, um, I mean, you could think about that with sports, but um, I usually think about reaction time honestly with driving, right? So you're driving a car. How quickly can you see something come out into the road and you hit the brakes? That, that's your response time or reaction time. And that reaction time slows. Um, so the older you get, the slower you're going to be to hit the brakes. Um, also, in middle and late adulthood, you're going to see a decrease in your manual dexterity, your fingers, your fine motor skills, right? And I can attest to this 100%. Now, if you're a great piano player, maybe your fingers are in tip-top shape. But for me, um, oh, I mean, my hands are just not quick like they used to be. And this is something you just start to lose over time. Uh, now, depending on what your hobbies are and your activities are, that can be um, have a huge impact on your life. If you've always been working with small objects or like in my previous life uh, where I helped people with hearing aids, um, getting an older adult who had a lot of fine motor problems to operate a small hearing aid and put batteries in and out of it. And um, this was a serious challenge. Uh, so knowing about those limitations. Okay, those are expected, but you can do things to combat them with exercises and, and just, you know, you've, you've heard the phrase, use it or lose it. Um, yeah, so practice. Okay, so let's move into the second half of this, which is really focusing on sensation and perception. So using your sensory systems, right? Vision, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. <laughs> there you go. So hopefully you remember from um, Introduction to Psychology, that these are two different terms, sensation versus perception, right? Sensation is detecting things in the environment, detecting light, detecting a smell, um, hearing a sound, right? Detecting those sound waves. That's information coming in and from the environment and hitting your sensory receptors. Now, sensory receptors are specialized cells in that sensory system for detecting information. For instance, for taste, your sensory receptors are your taste buds, and they're designed to detect, to detect chemicals, right, in your food. So um, you don't have taste buds in your eyeballs, obviously. You have different cells that detect light. Okay, so that's what sensation is. Stuff comes at you from the environment, and you're detecting it. Now, perception is you making sense of it. You're using your brain, you're using your memories, you're using your experiences, your expectations to interpret what's going on around you. So when I hear a sound, like a dog barking outside, my brain says, oh, that's my dog, did I leave her outside? Or my brain says, oh, that's the neighbor's dog, I wonder what's going on, right? That's perception, right? I'm using what I already know to understand what's happening around me. And that's typically what's going on in your life experience. You're walking around, you're in environments you've been in before, and you're using your memory and your expectations to um, interact with the world around you and understand what's happening around you. Occasionally, you run into situations where you don't know what's going on, right? Someone says something to you and you couldn't understand what they were saying, maybe it's noisy, that's when you're using sensation to try to really pick apart that signal and figure out what was happening. Okay, 
keeping in mind these two ideas of information coming in to your body and then you understanding it, right? Is sensation and perception. And guiding all of this, there are many, many different approaches to sensation and perception research, but one that's been brought up in this class, um, which is interesting to know about, is the ecological view. And this basically um, is similar to that dynamic systems theory. It's just saying that um, when we look around or the world, we hear things in the world, we want to interact with the world, right? We're looking at things and saying, oh, you know, cup of coffee, um, I wanna use this cup. I wanna drink out of it. I wanna use it to hold my papers down so they don't blow away. Um, what can I do with the things in the world around me? How can I interact with them? Um, and that's the ecological view. And again, we'll, we'll kind of um, talk similarly about this with Piaget because um, we want to interact with the world around us. Okay, so let's look at vision. And this is what we'll spend mo more time on than any other sense because it's the one that's been most studied. Um, and honestly, it's the easiest to study in psychology. Um, it's a lot easier to present visual information to someone and ask them questions than to present smells. <laughs> that's kind of tricky. Okay, anyway, so vision. If you think back to what you know about the anatomy of your visual system, um, the key parts that we're really interested in um, are um, turning that light information into information that your nervous system and the brain can use. So here's a picture, right, a drawing of um, a side view of the eyeball, where here is um, where your pupil and lens would be and light would come in and hit the back of the eyeball, the inner lining of the back of the eyeball, and that is the retina. And all over the retina, you have rod cells and cone cells. Um, they're named that because of their shape. And you can see looking directly at the retina, this is the way it would essentially look. You would have these colored dots would be cone cells and the white-ish dots, tan dots, are the rod cells. Now the cones cells detect color and detail. And you need light for those cone cells to, be, to work. The rod cells detect peripheral movement, and they don't see color. They just see dim light and brighter light. So the rods are gonna be what's working when the light, you know, you go outside at night and there's hardly any light out. Those rod cells are gonna be helping you out. Okay, this is the arrangement, right? Light hits the back of your eyeball. Hopefully you can see color, detail, you can see motion, all these things. If we look at the development of the visual system across the lifespan, um, when you're born is when you first get to open your eyes and start using those eyeballs. Um, with that said, by six months old, um, most babies will have 20-20 vision, which is what, perfect vision, I guess, <laughs> right? So, um, and we can see through different studies, um, the development of depth perception, right? Your ability to see how far away something is and also visual preferences. So to study depth perception, there's been a really fascinating way of looking at this. It's called a visual clip experiment. And that's what this image is over here. You see this baby, right? On top of this glass table. And it appears like there's a cliff, even though the glass extends all the way to mom or dad. Um, that question is, is will the baby leave what appears to be safety to walk across this glass or they will they use their depth perception to be hesitant and think that um, it's a cliff. So we can watch a quick video um, showing some of this. Study babies between 9 and 12 months are brought into the lab and placed on a large plexiglass top table. Half of the table has a checkerboard pattern just underneath the surface. But halfway across is a visual cliff, which the baby can tell drops off steeply. The plexiglass top continues, so it's perfectly fine to proceed. But the baby isn't so sure. And this is a big drop for a baby just starting to crawl. She wants to get across to get the toy. But she's cautious and looks to the opposite end of the table where her mother is. 
the parent is instructed to smile or make a fear face. If the mother is posing a fear face, the baby typically does not cross this stair step downward, this modified visual cliff or visual step. On the other hand, if the mother poses a smile, or somehow poses a nonverbal communication that is not prohibitive but encouraging, the child is much more likely to cross over to her. <laughs> this particular study demonstrates the role of nonverbal communication in determining the child's behavior in uncertain contexts. A baby will, when they encounter something ambiguous, something uncertain, will typically look to the significant other, the mother, the father, uh, a grandparent, uh, the caregiver, in order to figure out what to do. So by 11 to 12 months of <laughs> study, baby. Okay, so, adorable. <laughs> Um, you can see, right? Those babies are like, hmm, I've been crawling now for a little while and that looks dangerous, right? So that's proof that they have working depth perception and that exploring their environment has been giving them all of the sensory information that they can then use, right, to guide their motor skills. Visual preference studies uh, show that even uh, very young infants are going to prefer looking at faces, human faces, versus other complex drawings. They also prefer three dimensions to two dimensional shapes um, and just more complex and colorful and interesting things to look at. Um, if we look across the lifespan um, in early adulthood, this is your peak for your vision, right? Your, your eyes are hopefully working great, your depth perception is excellent, um, your ability to quickly scan visually the environment and pick out information is the fastest that it will be. Um, in middle adulthood, we start to see some declines in vision. Uh, first, we could just say presbyopia, which means a loss of vision due to aging, starts to become apparent in middle adulthood. And I can attest to this myself also. Got my first pair of glasses when I was 40 years old. Um, and only within a few more years, they asked me to switch to bifocals. Right? So you see a lot of individuals who even who had always had normal vision, suddenly are having difficulty reading up close, right? This would be your presbyopia, those vision changes due to aging. We also start to see some decreased depth perception. So your ability to judge how far away something is, even if it's um, objects in the near environment or things that are farther away. And this may be when you start to see some problems um, associated with the health of your auditory system. Um, glaucoma may start to um, become apparent in middle adulthood. And this is when you have pressure buildup in the eyeball that starts to press on your optic nerve. Um, and if you've ever had a comprehensive vision assessment, you would have had the pressure tested in your eyeball to check for glaucoma. In late adulthood, you start to see some more issues. All, still glaucoma, again, could emerge. Um, cataracts are when you have clouding of the lens of your eye. So you would see um, actually looking at the person, it looks kind of cloudy um, in the black um, pupil of their eye. I actually have this, um, my dog has cataracts, so when I look at her eyes, I can see the cloudiness. And this can be fixed um, by, I don't know, honestly, I haven't looked into this surgery, but my father-in-law had it, and whew, he can see great now after having those cataracts uh, fixed. Um, also, you might see in some individuals age-related macular degeneration, and this is degeneration on the retina of those cone cells. Um, and this is very um, troubling, right? Because you start to lose that ability to um, see detail and color and um, each individual is different. So some, it may um, cause blindness and um, others, it may 
um, take much longer um, for significant problems to occur. And then you also just see processing speed declines, especially in late adulthood. It takes longer for someone to find something in the environment. So you're searching visually for something and it just takes a lot longer. And this especially is also apparent with driving, right? So if you're an older adult, you're driving in a place you haven't been before and you're looking for street signs, right? To find the, the street that you need to turn on and it takes longer to find those street signs. It's, it's just more difficult. Okay, hearing. Um, here is um, a diagram of your auditory system. Hopefully it looks familiar. Uh, you've got your outer ear here, your ear canal, your middle ear with your eardrum and the bones in your ear, and then this snail-shaped cochlea. And it's in the cochlea where you have your sensory receptors for hearing. So all these little, there's little cells all on the cochlea. They're called hair cells. And um, those bend. Um, when air pressure waves occur, which is sound. Um, if you're really interested in hearing, I teach a whole entire class on this in the spring um, called Com Introduction to Communication Disorders. Um, and that is for people who want to be speech pathologists or audiologists. So I spent hours talking about the auditory system, but here I'm gonna spend like one slide. <laughs> so you've got um, over the lifespan, Unlike vision, your hearing starts to develop before you are born. So when you are in the womb, that baby can hear mom's voice and it can hear loud environmental sounds. Um, I'm sure that long before my babies were born, they were used to hearing my dog barking, the vacuum cleaner running, um, me talking, right? The, the rise and fall of the pitch of my voice when I'm having conversations with other people. Um, that is developing uh, before you're born. So hearing is already present. In, in infancy through childhood, one common issue that comes up is ear infections. And the technical term for that is otitis media, which means inflammation of the middle ear, right? So fluid uh, gets stuck, really in this middle ear space because your eustachian tube isn't working properly. And so um, chronic ear infections uh, can be painful. Some of you probably remember what it's like to have an ear infection, but it also makes it harder to hear. So it's like having earplugs in your ears. And we know from research that if you have lots of ear infections in childhood, that this is related to um, delays in your speech development, and that can even roll into uh, reading literacy problems. So making sure that those ear infections are treated is really important. If we look at the end of the lifespan, uh, middle through late adulthood, we start to see some loss in hearing, and this is called presbycusis. So decline in hearing due to aging. And typically that is um, a decline in your ability to hear higher pitches, which if we think about what speech sounds like, consonants, t, s, k, sh, these are all very high frequency sounds. And these are the sounds that become very difficult for people to hear. So my mother has this and she will often say to me, stop mumbling. Like, well, I'm not mumbling. You just have a hearing loss, mom. But she doesn't want to hear about that. Uh, it's just hard. It's like putting um, a hand over your mouth so that when you're talking, what that person is mostly hearing is vowel sounds. Uh, so this is somewhat common. But I will say what's also common is that for some reason, people don't really want to get treated for hearing loss. So there are many individuals who will end up getting an assessment. They're told they have um, age-related hearing impairment and that they would benefit from wearing hearing aids, but only about 20% of those people go on to wearing hearing aids. Um, far more people will wear eyeglasses than they will hearing aids. Um, there's a lot that goes into wearing a hearing aid. It takes 
time to really get used to it and to understand how to use them well without them being annoying or uncomfortable. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, but uh, it's, there's just a lot of reluctance from individuals. So something to be aware of. Uh, also, before I leave this, I have way too much information about this in my head, but uh, some people in late adulthood can be um, mistakenly thought to have dementia or even depression but it's actually a hearing loss. They just can't hear what you're saying. It's not that they don't understand you or that they have a cognitive decline. It, it could be that they can't hear you. So this is a really easy thing to, to check before you start making the leap to dementia or um, depression. Okay, so what about our other sensory systems? I'm gonna spend even less time on this, right? Taste and smell, right? Those are great senses. Um, of course, they can tell you wonderful tastes and smells and horrible ones. Um, in infancy, those babies, before they're even born, have been experiencing taste in the womb, right? What mom is eating, that is um, getting passed on to the baby. And infants as young as 12 days old can tell the difference in the smell of what their mother smells like versus a stranger. Right, they recognize that smell. So that's already working, those sensory systems. In late adulthood, it's very common to see a decline in taste and smell. And this is actually pretty crucial for health. Um, if you start to lose your ability to smell or to taste things, this is going to affect your nutrition because now food isn't really enjoyable. And when that's the case, you see a lot of older adults who simply aren't eating enough um, they're experiencing malnutrition. So this is a really important thing to just keep an eye on. Also, sometimes um, older adults might start over seasoning their food using tons of salt or like my uncle, hot sauce on everything because he says he can't taste or smell anything. So he just pours it all over there, all over the food, hoping that he'll be able to taste it. Uh, so it's something to keep your, um, in your mind because this can affect um, the nutrition and health of individuals in late adulthood. And then lastly, your sense of touch. Um, for some reason, historically, it was thought that infants really weren't that sensitive to touch. I really don't know why, because they are. They're very sensitive. Um, I mean, boy, if you've ever spent time with a baby that gets easily irritated because there's a tag on their clothing, I mean, they don't, they don't like that, right? They wanna be held, they wanna be snuggled, they wanna be stroked. Uh, they're very sensitive to touch, and this is a, a good way to soothe the baby, right? Is um, especially that skin-to-skin -skin contact when they're infants. So, infants are highly sensitive to touch, um, and then we can think about how at the end of life and late adulthood, um, some individuals start to lose sensitivity, especially in their legs and feet, to the sense of touch. They may not um, even know that they've got an injury. Um, to their skin or a cut or something like that um, on their lower legs specifically. Uh, and on the flip side, um, over half of older adults report chronic pain. Um, so that is also a problem. Um, I mean, your body is often experiencing a lot of declines that can be associated with pain. Uh, but just keeping this in mind um, and how the sense of touch is affecting older adults. Okay, those are all our sensory systems. That was quick. Um, now you've got all of chapter five and uh, good luck getting ready for your exam.